of it over there as I refer to sure. it, and you can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a home interview, Water of Elite, New York. It is uh, the 25th of January, 2006, approximately 10:30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Larry O'Sullivan. I was born in Ireland in 1924. I came to this country in 1929. Okay. Why did your uh, parents come here? Your... I never knew my father. I never set eyes on him. My mother uh, had uh, my brother John, who was four years older than I, and. Uh, When my father died, <coughs> apparently at the hands of the English, uh, my mother came over here in 1927. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, in 1927, <coughs> to make enough money to send for me and my brother, and we stayed at my grandmother's house in Ireland. We lived on a farm, and uh, she raised geese on the farm. I remember one time she had uh, a flock of geese, a little baby goslings, and uh, I was only uh, three years old at the time and I fell in love with them. Tiny little little fluffs following the mother and I scooped them up into my arms and I killed one of them. Now this is representative of my memories of Ireland, which were rather horrible. My grandmother was good to me, but she lived on these geese and the geese egg, goose eggs. So she took me by the ear, screaming. I threw me into the barn, closed the door, and I really didn't know what I had done except hug and love those little geese, the little baby gosling. I knew that God was mad at me too because it started a storm and the rain started to come underneath the barn. So guilt is deeply ingrained in my DNA. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I. Uh, after the service, I'm well, sorry, before, you went before service. I went to the service, I, uh, I was uh, educated in Brooklyn, Sheepshead Bay, in, uh, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, had graduated from high school, <clears throat> elementary school, then high school. Do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was, uh, let's see, uh, that was in 1941, I was 17, and uh, I don't remember exactly, but I do remember the radio. We had no TV at that time, mm -hmm. but I do remember the radio blaring away, and I remember President Roosevelt's notice and uh, uh, statement that we are at war with Japan and uh, I could feel that this was a terrible thing that had happened. Mm -hmm. Now did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? I was, uh, I volunteered. My brother had gone into the army in uh, 1940. Things were rather rough. It was depression. <clears throat> when we got here in 1929, the stock market crashed, and it was a very rough time for us. Two kids, and my, st my mother had remarried, and uh, he had worked on Wall Street as a runner, and he had uh, lost his job. So it was very rough for us, and uh, he had, uh, my brother had to quit high school and uh, work at Rolston's grocery store delivering groceries 
So he joined the army in 1940, and he told me after war had broken out in 1941, he said, whatever you do, don't go in the army. Join the Navy, which I did. Okay. Uh, so that's the reason why you joined the Navy? Yes. Um, how long did your brother serve in this? Do your brother survive the war? Or? Well, he, uh, he did survive, but he was discharged honorably with 100% disability because of a crane, train crash he was in. So he served honorably. He invented some things, as a matter of fact, which the Army adopted. He was in an anti-tank corps, and uh, he invented things which the Army adopted. And I have the uh, papers, uh, his uh, uh, patent papers, which the uh, government gave to him. So he uh, he uh, was, was died about uh, four years ago. <clears throat> so he lived in in Florida in a nursing home, and we were very close. Now you enlisted in November of '42. Where did you go for your basic training? I went to Great Lakes uh, boot camp. Mm -hmm. Sampson. <clears throat> Uh, naval base, named after Admiral William Sampson, uh, Sampson, Sampson, Sampson of the uh, Spanish-American War. So you, you went to Sampson out in the central, central part of New York State? No, of, oh. uh, from Brooklyn I went to Chicago, oh, which okay. was the Sampson Naval oh, okay, Base in uh, okay. Chicago. <laughs> Very cold, mm -hmm. it was freezing as a matter of fact, they got us up. And now I'm 18 years old, and uh, they would get us up early in the morning to uh, run around the base, four or five o'clock in the morning, and we'd be slipping on the ice, falling down, and running over each other. But it was a huge mass of sailors, so we couldn't stop for anything. So if you fell down, it was just tough luck. You had to survive one way or another. And I did get through basic training, and I was about to graduate with my buddies when I caught the flu. So I had to go through the whole two months all over again. Same shots, all over, inoculations all over again. It was really a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you basically had, you had two basic trainings then? I had two basic oh. trainings. Then they sent me down to Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, they, they, first they gave me some tests uh, to determine which school I would go to because the Navy had lots of schools and mm -hmm. I could have any sort of training I wanted to. I wanted to be a cook because I wanted to be near food. Growing up during the Depression, we were lucky if we had a a bowl of uh, potatoes, smashed potatoes with a blob of butter or something in it, We, because we were always hungry. Mm -hmm. My brother joined the CCCs <coughs> before he went in the service. My brother joined the CCCs, Con Civilian Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, in order to get uh, clothing and to food for himself. So it was a rough time uh, growing up, and that's what I wanted to be, a cook. So I took all the tests and they said, well, you did rather well on the tests, but you have to take a, a second choice. You have to put down two choices. My first choice was Cooks and Baker School, and the second choice, I looked down the, the list of insignias that would be put on the uniform. And I said, gee, here's a great insignia. It was wings with what looked like a bomb or a sunrise or something in the middle. I said, I'd like that on my uniform. I had no idea what it was. It was aviation ordinance. So I found myself going down to Memphis to go to aviation ordinance school. And I had to learn everything. I had no idea what the word ordinance meant, but I had to learn everything about naval Ordnance, which meant, which meant guns, torpedoes, bombs, 
anything fuses, anything to do with ordnance, I had to learn about. And we had to learn how to take every weapon apart, blindfolded, and then put it back together again. That was part of our naval training. So we went from pistols to 20 millimeter cannon, which we had to take apart, blindfolded, and put back together again. And uh, we did rather well on that. And then I became an aerial gunner because the next step in my training was to learn how to shoot those guns, especially the machine guns from airplanes. Mm -hmm. So these were my buddies. <coughs> if you hold it back hold it here, back. Oh, yeah, okay, back forward right there, forward. Wayne can focus on that. These were my buddies that I graduated from Aviation and Ordnance School with. Whereabouts are you in that picture? See, I'm down here. Okay. I'm the good looking one. Now a number of these fellows never came back. After school, of course, we all went to their different areas of You can put that down now. Thank different you. areas of the uh, of the uh, war, and, and I went to the South, the South Pacific. So you were assigned a unit right from <coughs> graduation of or, from ordnance school right to uh, a unit? Well, the first thing we did was get training mm -hmm. and shooting from airplanes. Now, the first airplane I was trained and shoot, to shoot from, uh, shoot machine guns from, was what we called a PBY Catalina. Were you uh, in the Air Force? Oh. No, no, but I know what a PBY was, okay. a flying boat. PBY was yeah. a flying boat, you're right, Wayne, uh, Mike. And uh, it had big blisters on the side, and we had machine guns, which we shoot down. And uh, we got training in that, and we had to learn how to fly it. I, I didn't even know how to drive a car. Because flying a PBY was a very simple thing, actually. I didn't take it off or land it, but the pilots would train us. As a matter of fact, they would go back and take a nap. It was such a boring. We'd go along what, what is now the, what was called the tri uh, Bermuda Triangle uh, along the Florida coast looking for submarines in 1942 <coughs> and uh, 43. And the... Uh, one time I saw when the pilots were back there taking a nap, and <coughs> I was at the controls, <coughs> excuse me, and I thought I saw a submarine, so I banked the plane down <coughs> to take a look. The pilot fell out of the cot, came running up, said, what's the matter, what's the matter? So I told him what happened. Well, he chased me out of the seat. <laughs> I never flew another plane again from at least a PBY. So that was my introduction to flying. Now what type of uh, machine gun did that PBY have? That was a 50 caliber machine gun. They had twin 30s and then they had 50 caliber machine guns. <coughs> and uh, then we got to fly, uh, and then I got to, f I was assigned to uh, a squadron. <coughs> I got training in California uh, to learn how to tow targets <coughs> in torpedo bombers, there was a <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> there was a. Will you stop there a second? We got training in uh, to learn how to tow targets mm -hmm. and uh, in torpedo bombers. Now this is a single engine airplane, rather big, high, with a bomb bay, which would open up, it carried a big torpedo, about 20 foot torpedo in it, and we would have to straddle the, tor the bomb bay, and then throw out a target, and then control the flight of the target with a, a winch, which let out cable. And that target was about 
20 or 30 feet long, and it was about, I guess, maybe eight feet around in circumference, about maybe four foot, three foot in uh, diameter. And we would have to tow that target back and forth so that the, tor the uh, battleships, uh, gunners on the battleships, and the warships down below could shoot at it. Uh, they would have to lead the target, and quite often you could see the tracer bullets coming up, and they'd have to shoot at the airplane that I was in. And then by the time the bullet got up here, the, the hopefully it would hit the target. Mm -hmm. They would have to go in front of the, to train them to shoot in front of the airplane so that the airplane and the bullet would meet. But I got bored with doing that. I was, we were sent down to uh, the South Pacific, to Espirito Santos in the Hebrides, in New Hebrides. And uh, I got do bored with doing that. And then they asked for volunteers to uh, shoot in, uh, to fly in torpedo bombers. Uh, not torpedo bombers, in dive bombers. So that was the next unit I went into in, uh, in the South Pacific. Is that the uh, Douglas Dauntless? That's the Douglas Dauntless. Very good, Wayne. SBD-5. There were only two in the Douglas Dauntless, the pilot and myself in the back, and <coughs> the gunner. And I had twin 30 caliber machine guns in the back. Now that was fun, because the pilots were usually young guys, and they would try to get us sick by doing snap rolls and barrel rolls and dog fights during their training period uh -huh. down there, see. So that was a great time with the uh, flying and this. <coughs> this is my mother, by the way. That's my brother, my brother and me. I, I'm in the sailor suit. <coughs> okay. This was a, <coughs> a card I got for crossing the equator. Okay. It was a sort of an, an initiation. They called us uh, polywogs. And then when you got across the equator, you become a shellback. Then they gave us a different card for crossing the international date line. When it, you skip a, a day, as a matter of fact. So we went all over the Pacific. Now were you assigned to a, a land-based unit or a carrier? These were land-based mm -hmm. units, correct. Oh, well, that's myself. <clears throat> In my... Uh, flight gear. I have uh, ammunition strung around my neck there. Is that a 45 at your hip? That's a 45. Okay. We were issued uh, pistols. <coughs> so that was fun. So when, yeah. when you went out in these, um, did you wear like a May West? And, and Oh yes, yes. And you carried your pistol with you all the time? Oh yes, correct, mm -hmm. in case we got shot down. A book just came out about the Flyboys. We were called Flyboys. Matter of fact, this was written by James Bradley in 19, uh, 2003, as a matter of fact, only a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It told about the Flyboys. Now, is your unit mentioned in there at all? or Not my unit, mm -hmm. but uh, this, this particularly, this, this uh, book, was designed, was uh, written to expose what happened to us if the, we were shot down and captured by the Japanese. Oddly enough, if we, if, I don't know how many of my buddies were, I never saw uh, uh, most of them, I don't know what happened to them, but some of them might have been captured and tortured and beheaded by the Japanese. One particular island that this book referred to was Chichijima, which was not far from Iwo Jima, 
one of the most famous battles in the South Pacific. Now, Chichi Jima was a, a Japanese com communications base, and the Navy was designed, the Navy gunners and torpedo bombers and dive bombers were assigned to knock out that communications hub because they sent messages to Tokyo to tell Tokyo where the American Navy was, various ships and so forth. <clears throat> this is what we had to wear when we went on high flight, high altitude missions. <clears throat> they tried to sell some Wheaties in 1942 by showing the public what we uh, had to go through. But uh, Chichi Jima <clears throat> was manned by Japanese fanatics. As I said, they would cut off your your head, the, uh, those who, that they captured, they would cut off our heads and then eat our livers because according to custom if you ate the liver of your enemy you would get the strength and daring and power of your enemy and uh, oddly enough this was George Bush President George Bush senior was shot down flying over Chichijima. As a matter of fact, he is mentioned in this book quite uh, prominently, and there we have uh, pictures of him, photographs of him in that. <coughs> and uh, he lost two gunners that he had in his torpedo bomber. They were never found again, never heard from again. <coughs> what happened to them, we don't know. But we do know, thanks to this book, that the reason that the Japanese tortured and beheaded the flyboys was in vengeance for what Teddy Roosevelt's generals did in 1901, in 1902, and in 1903 when we had owned the Philippine Islands thanks to the Spanish-American War. We promised, President McKinley promised the Filipinos their independence because Japan had taken them over. And Spain, they actually, they were owned by Spain. <coughs> but uh, they were uh, promised their independence by President McKinley, but he was shot. And then President Roosevelt took over. He wanted to keep the Philippines. So the, he wanted to exercise his power. He was a strange, tragic man, Teddy Roosevelt. He grew up a weakling. I, I pretty much parallel his childhood. I was a weakling when I was growing up. And uh, he wanted to, he wanted the love of his father. He never got it because his father rejected him because he was a weakling. He determined to make himself a powerful person, and he did. He went to all sorts of exercises, and lengths to build up his body, and he became as strong, as he said, as a bull moose. Matter of fact, the Bull Moose Party was founded by him, I think it was in 1910 or 1912. And uh, he was driven by the obsession to become powerful. Every photo you see of him in the movies and, and historical movies, you'll see him bang on a desk or something and stabbing at the, at the air. This was the sort of person he was. He was, he was obsessed with power. As a matter of fact, when he was a politician here in New York, he wanted to invade Canada. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize 
for negotiating a peace between Russia and I used to teach history so I knew about this. He negotiated a peace prize, uh, a peace between Russia and Japan who were at war and uh, oddly enough he admired Japan for beating Japan, for, uh, for beating Russia which was a much bigger, more powerful country but Japan had designs of world power on its own and Teddy Roosevelt told the Japanese why don't you take over Korea Korea is a weakling. You belong in the, with us in the powerful nations. This was after the United States became powerful by winning the Spanish-American War. So he actually encouraged the Japanese to take over Korea, which they did, and which Teddy Roosevelt approved of and helped <clears throat> to, to recognize, God bless you. Pardon me. Hey, Victor, um, when you were out in the Pacific, how many uh, missions did you fly? I don't remember, Mike. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I try to forget about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where were you based from? We, were, we went from island to island. Mm -hmm. We were started out in the New Hebrides, Espiritu Santos, and uh, that's down near Australia. And then we worked our way up towards uh, the Philippines. But in the, uh, when I joined the dive bombing squadron, I uh, avoided this being beheaded and killed because of uh, Japanese vengeance for what Teddy Roosevelt's generals did in the Philippines because I got malaria. And that ended my flying days. Malaria is something that's still with me. It never leaves you. But because of that, I no longer was threatened or had to under worry about being uh, having my liver eaten by the Japanese if they captured me and if I was shot down. What were your duties after you uh, came out of the hospital with the malaria then? Good question, Mike. I uh, was sent to the Philippines <coughs> and worked for uh, near the Tacloban Air Force, Air Base, <clears throat> in Leyte. This is where General MacArthur landed when he returned. Now Leyte was a key uh, island and uh, when General MacArthur landed there, I happened to be there. Matter of fact, I remember sitting on the beach waiting for him to come ashore. It had to do it a couple of times for the cameras because it was a big photo op, uh, big publicity stunt. So you were there when he actually walked <coughs> ashore? Yes. And uh, he, the boss, the uh, CO, of uh, the unit I was with, the unit I was with serviced the bombers on Tacloban Air Force, Air Force, Air, Force, Air Base. So when uh, the CO and the some girl, a uh, woman, was sitting on the uh, next to us in their jeep, waiting for MacArthur to land, and I remember. She took an apple, it was half eaten, and she threw it in front of us on the beach. Now, we were hungry. We had very little to eat, as a matter of fact, in the, on the islands. We had limited resources, limited deliveries, until after the war, the fighting was shot over, the, sh the shooting was over. But I remember that apple. It was a big, one of those big, red, delicious apples apples and it was rolling on the, on the sand in front of me and I wanted in the worst way to grab that apple and to wipe the sand off it and eat it because I was so hungry for an apple something we hadn't seen since the beginning of the war 
So that st st stuck in my mind about uh, Mac MacArthur's landing on Leyte. Did you see him at all after that? No, no. He he disappeared in <coughs> in a sea of uh, cameras and uh, press people. So the uh, the um, next thing that happened to me <coughs> was the uh, I saw some a plane land. I, I was servicing a bomber at one night. It was about one or two in the morning, and there was a bomber, a uh, cargo plane landed, and a lot of civilians got off of this plane. And uh, I was wondering what was going on. I later found out that it was part of the Great Raid. You probably saw that movie, The Great Raid. It's still showing in the theaters, just came out last year. About the most successful rescue mission of the entire war, in which over a thousand prisoners of war which were held near Leyte in a, in, in a prisoner of war camp by the Japanese, they were rescued by a group of uh, paratroopers. I think his, the captain's name is Ringler, I believe, <coughs> who led that raid. And they all paratroop they landed and they rescued these people before the Japanese could kill them because they were ordered to kill every prisoner of war should they, the uh, landing take. They knew they were going to be, uh, attempt was going to be made to try to rescue them. So they were ordered to kill all the prisoners of war, but the rescuers, the Americans, and I believe there were others involved, they rescued over a thousand of the prisoners of war and some of those landed on Tackloban Airport that night when I was there servicing one of the bombers, loading up one of the bombers because we were still sending bombers over trying to knock out Japan to Tokyo. This was before the atom bomb landed. <laughs> so, to end the war. So, I laid, I'm so sorry. I'm go ahead, finish your... I later found out <coughs> that one of the people that were one of the prisoners of war there was from this little town of Waterville, New York. He was Reverend Fred Julian. He was a priest who had been captured by the Japanese on December 7th, 1941, the beginning of the war. And he was taken prisoner and held there. Now he, while his four years, almost four years that he was held there, he helped various American soldiers and others who had uh, escaped and were hiding in the Philippine Islands. So he was a war hero himself. And I also found out that one of those that, one of the paratroopers that went down to rescue him was from what of late? Dr. Zoni Sheremita was his name. One of the weirdest coincidences imaginable. 8,000 miles away, and there the two of them meet. And here I was there at the same time. Now, I'm not a native of Water Belit. I've only lived here about 15 years. This is in 19, <coughs> 2006 now. And uh, so we, the three of us got together, and we had a photo op in the uh, Times Union. Did a big story about us and took off a, a photograph. photograph. But what my wife and I wanted to do <clears throat> was to remember what Father Julian did and Dr. Jeremita. Dr. Jeremita was a, 
medical uh, assistance <clears throat> at that time that he landed to rescue the, the prisoners of war in the Philippines in 1943. And uh, when he got back, he became a doctor. So what I wanted to do, and Grace and I wanted to do for Father Julian, was to share the medal that the Filipinos gave us for helping to free their country from the Japanese. This is the medal that the Philippine government gave to us. Anybody that was involved in freeing the Philippine government from the Japanese in World War II. So we made copies of these medals and we gave one to Dr. Zeramita and one to Father Julian. Now Father Julian went back, he wrote a book called Promises Kept. He went back to the Philippines. Oh, the promise he made when he was kneeling down and bullets were flying over his head during the rescue operation. He made a promise to God that if he got out of this alive, he would come back and he would set up a mission to help the Filipino people. He did. He went back, he not just set up a mission, a whole city was developed around his little mission. And a business was developed that they could support themselves. This mission provided free housing, free food, free medical, free schooling for all any Filipino that person that wanted it. And it's still in operation today. What a wonderful testimonial to the American way of life, to Father Julian, to Water Belit, and to America. Because that mission is still in operation today. And that's something that I think we Americans be, we can be proud of, that this was done on their behalf and in spite of what the Japanese did to the Flyboys. Now, what were your other duties in the time you remained, when you remained in the Philippines? Well, I was uh, supposed to help load the bombers with fuel. <clears throat> I was driving a big gas tank. I was driving, I was in charge of the motor pool. In, in, uh, in, in Tacloban, in Leyte, and uh, I was assigned trucks to send out trucks and to derive the trucks and drive the gas tanks to load up the bombs, the big bombers, which would take off and fly over Japan and try to get Japan to stop the war. I remember We used to go into the bomb bay. Now, these bombers had huge gas tanks, neoprene gas tanks, and I could barely get into the bomb bay because there was only about a foot or two of space in the bomb bay. And I would have to reach my hand up and into the mouth of the, where the <coughs> tank would be would getting the fuel and I would have to wiggle my finger in there to determine when the uh, fuel was, had reached the top. The fumes inside of that thing were so heavy that when we got out of there we would be staggering around, we would be high as a kite, and you couldn't drive a tank, a tanker, uh, one of those big tankers in that condition, so it took a little while to get my head clear. But that was one of the jobs I had during the, my time in, in uh, the Philippines. Then one day somebody came, <clears throat> one of my buddies came, and uh, 
he said that the girl who did his wash, her family, her relatives were up in the hills. They were suffering, starving. They had no money. They had no food because the Japanese had stolen all of their chickens and geek ducks and uh, goats and whatever they had. So they were starving. The Japanese had left by now because uh, we would take, had taken over the island of Leyte. So he said, do you think we could get a load of food up to them? Do you think we could get one of our pick up uh, one of our uh, trucks to bring up some food up there to those people. And I said, why not? I was in charge of the pool. Nobody was going to use the trucks. I was, uh, I was off when I, I got off that afternoon. So we loaded up the truck full of food, chickens and stuff that uh, the people in Tacloban provided for this family. And we drove it up, my buddy and I drove it up the hills. I think it was Oolong Oolong was the name of the village where they lived. And we drove it up and we brought that truckload of food up there. It was about maybe five, six miles away. There were no Japanese, no enemies or enemy uh, soldiers around. So on the way back, <coughs> well, I went to the truck and I found I couldn't start it because of where I had parked the truck. I found I couldn't start it. It seems that the shore patrol or the military police saw the truck. They thought it was abandoned and they disarmed, they disconnected one of the uh, pipe uh, wires so I couldn't start it. So I had to sleep in the truck. My buddy and I had to sleep in the truck overnight. The next day, they came back and they put the wire back in and I was able to go back down. And I was charged with being AWOL for eight hours. That's AWOL is absent without official leave. And I was given a deck court. And uh, I had to stand there and in front of the uh, the CO and told him why I brought the food up to the uh, to the Filipinos to the starving Filipino family and he said 20 days at hard labor might have been 23 days or three weeks I forget which so I was sentenced to three weeks at hard labor in a prisoner of war camp but this was a stockade for American prisoners and I really worked. I had just had malaria, I was skinny as a rail, I weighed about a hundred pounds, but I had to haul big bags of cement that were ducked at, dumped at the dock over to uh, another truck or something. So I that, did this for about uh, two weeks and uh, I had to go into the doctors to uh, something, oh I got a sore on my foot and I wasn't breathing right because I was breathing in the, the uh, cement dust. <coughs> it was really hot uh, doing this work. And the doctor said, what are you doing here? So I told him what happened and he arranged, he says, you shouldn't be in prison, you shouldn't be here. So he arranged for me to go home not just back to my base, not back to my tent, but back home to the States. So that's how I, I was given a dis, I was given an honorable discharge after I got back to the States. And, uh, but the doctor got me out of that mess because he felt sorry for me, which I appreciated very much. Now, did you ever, uh, after you were discharged, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Oh, I certainly did. When I, uh, I uh, met my wife, <coughs> Grace, 
Let's see, I went in when I was 18, got out when I was 22, and 23 I met Grace. And uh, she was walking down the street with my sister because she and my sister used to pal around together. And uh, as she passed on, now here I am in my sailor suit with my medals on, my wings. I looked like a hot shot. And she was 17. Just graduated from high school. And we just passed each other. And I looked around at her. And she looked around at me. <laughs> that was it. I fell in love. Love at first sight. And that was 59 years ago. We got married Christmas Eve, 1947. And uh, we've been together ever since. They said it would never work because she was Protestant. And uh, I was Catholic. And, uh, but here we are together after 58 years of marriage. So I forgot what the question was. Oh, if you use the GI Bill. Oh, yes. Well, because we got married, I had to, I was going to school at the time, to St. John's University, and uh, the GI Bill allowed me to go to receive income as I went to school. I was going full time. So you used the 5220 club? I used the 5220, which gave me $20 a week, I think it was, or a month, for 52 weeks. So I used that, and then I also went to school, which gave me an income every month. But then when I got married, I had to go at night to finish my schooling to receive the checks, but also to get some money because a baby came along. My daughter Sharon came along pretty darn quick. I was a virgin when I went in, and I was a virgin when I came out. So the baby started to come rather quick. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I joined the uh, Disabled American Veterans and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. I joined, my brother joined the uh, American Legion. So we had all bases covered. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No. We were all from different parts mm -hmm. of the country. And I never never got in touch with any of them again. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well that brings me back to the time that I was born. Because I was born in Ireland and uh, I think the Irish in their DNA, I think they were made to fight. Believe it or not. I think we are one of the things that uh, I remember reading about, and they still teach in, in uh, Irish history, Irish legends, <clears throat> was about how Ireland was formed. And one of the reasons, pardon me, one of the legends about Ireland had to do with Queen Scota. Now this is Queen Scota raising the banner of Ireland's fighting force. Now that banner has a, a snake on it. Now the reason that banner has a snake on it was because Queen Scota was from, she was the daughter of, according to Irish legend in Irish history books, she was the daughter of a pharaoh in Egypt. And she married a Scythian prince. Scythia was a country next to Egypt. And about the time that Moses, about the time that Moses was being kicked out of Egypt, Queen Scota and her husband were also being kicked out of Egypt. The 
Pharaoh didn't like the idea that his daughter was, had married a Scythian, but they had a baby. And the baby was bitten by a serpent and was dying. About the time, as I said, that the Egyptians were kicking all of the Jews out of Egypt, Moses was there and he was getting ready to get his people together to flee Egypt. And Queen Scota heard about Moses' magical powers. So she brought the baby to Moses. Moses touched the baby's hand. The baby was cured. Moses foretold that that baby and his descendants would found an island free of serpents. Green. That island was Ireland, which they did. And that legend has been in Irish history ever since. So Irish children have been told by their Irish history to respect Moses and the Jews. So you the, think uh, part of your heritage then was to be in military service? That's what I said. The, uh -huh. the DNA, now this goes back thousands of years, hundreds, hundreds, and centuries and centuries. The DNA of the Irish, I believe, is to fight. I used to fight in the service, box. I never ma lost a match. I won money, as a matter of fact, that I could send home to my mother, fighting, boxing. I love to fight. It's just in Irish DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, that is in all of us. But I live by the what I call the honeysuckle syndrome, honeysuckle principle. The honeysuckle was made out of the Big Bang or whatever, but it was made to make me happy. Everything about the honeysuckle touches every one of my senses. Taste, sight, feeling. Why was the honeysuckle made? Now this is what I live by despite the fact that my DNA said I should fight, the honeysuckle tells me that somebody up there loves me, wants me to be happy in this world, and I live by the honeysuckle principle. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. <laughs> thank you, Mike. <laughs> oh, this is a, a picture of, by the way, of O'Sullivan, <clears throat> my... Uh, my brother got the uh, found out that uh, O'Sullivan was a royal name. Had see, there were a lot of kings in Ireland, and the O'Sullivans were one of the uh, kingdoms down in Cork, which was in Bantry Bay, near Bantry Bay. And this is Donal O'Sullivan. He was the earl. This is our coat of arms. For O'Sullivan. So we are fighters, but we are lovers. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. I wrote a book about uh, Theodore Roosevelt and his problems and how uh, it affected me in the service and how I escaped being beheaded because of the vengeance the Japanese took on the flyboys who were captured. He was one of the flyboys, but he was not captured. But it's all told about the book in The Flyboys, uh, his story is told. And I sent him a copy of my book about Teddy Roosevelt. And what was the title of that book? The title of the, of the book is Teddy Roosevelt's Rogue Admiral. Oh, here it is. 
Theodore Roosevelt's rogue admiral. Now this dealt with an admiral who had uh, was being put up against Theodore Roosevelt in, 19, in the 1904 election. Roosevelt wanted to maintain his power as president and he didn't want any opposition. So he called this admiral Winfield Scott Sly. He called him a coward, which ruined his chances of becoming president. I wrote the book trying to clear Admiral Sly's name because he was not a coward, he was a hero. As my book pointed out, I sent a copy of the book to President Bush, senior. And that was the letter I got back saying, thanking me for the book, it was a, an easy read and uh, he wished me good luck with the book. I would like President Bush and his son to please tell the Annapolis history teachers to change that story about that Teddy Roosevelt told about that admiral, Winfield Scott Sly, because they are still teaching that in today's Annapolis to Annapolis cadets that Sly was a coward. And this is something that should be corrected. And I'm pleading with the powers that be to try to change that and give this admiral the credit that is due him as a true hero, an American hero, who really won the Spanish-American War and set our country up as a world power. He deserves better than what he's getting. Thank you very much.